Hey y'all, today we're gonna tackle a really big issue within the paleo, primal, ancestral, evolutionary nutrition, whatever you wanna call it world. And that topic is dairy. With a big old exclamation point, dairy, right? Probably if you've read a couple of things about paleo here and there, you've heard that dairy is a paleo no-no. The problem with that though is dairy really is an it depends kind of food because there are potentially some positives for in consuming it some time and maybe there are some negatives that are bigger negatives for your life than the positives might be. So you can kind of decide the cost benefit analysis. We're gonna talk about what some of those positives and negatives are and maybe some things that you can do that if you do decide to incorporate dairy to make it a little less stressful on your body. What are some of the positives that we hear about dairy? Well, we definitely hear that it's got protein, right? I'm sure y'all have heard that. We definitely hear that it has calcium. I think that's probably the biggest one that we're, why we're told to eat dairy. And I think that for a lot of people is the one that is the most concerning is if I cut out my dairy, where am I gonna get my calcium from? The thing is, is there are a lot of other foods that have calcium in them. And uh, I have yet to see any convincing evidence that actually tells me that consuming all this calcium is doing anything to help any of the issues of bone mineralization that we have. There's more and more research that seems to point to the fact that in fact things like osteoporosis, osteopenia are not in fact issues of uh, bone mineralization or calcium, they are in fact issues of movement patterns. So that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. But I don't want you to stress out too much about calcium, but that is a reason that people often freak out about going paleo or why people would say that paleo may or may not be a good idea is because you're cutting out calcium and perhaps that's a problem. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about that though. The science does not back that up. So then we also have maybe, maybe you've heard lately that some of the fat in dairy could be a, a good fat. Good versus bad when it comes to nutrition is a pet peeve of mine, but you've probably heard this idea that dairy fat is good. Well, part of that is because dairy fat has a particular kind of fatty acid called conjugated linoleic acid. And I'm not gonna go into all the details about why that might be positive, but that's one of the reasons why dairy fat specifically is considered to be a good fat or potentially a good fat. So these are the basic positives. I'm sure there are more out there that you guys know of, but I think that pretty much covers it. Now, what are the potential negatives? Well, I'm gonna put the negatives on this side. So potential negatives. Well, the big one that most people think about is lactose. Lactose is the sugar that's in milk. Lactose is often what gives people an upset stomach when they eat dairy and they don't feel great about it. I'm sure most of you guys have probably heard about lactose issues, right? You can find lactose-free dairy and all these other things. The truth is 70% of the world population is lactose intolerant to some degree or another past the age of about three years old. Let me say that again. 70% of the worldwide population or somewhere thereabouts is lactose intolerant past the age of three. That's a pretty big deal. That means that they might get an upset stomach or maybe they get achy joints or brain fog or something. How it manifests is different for everybody. A lot of us don't even know if we have any kind of lactose issue because we are dosing ourselves with dairy all the time that we don't know what it feels like to not have it in our system and then therefore we don't know what it feels like to actually feel 100%. I know that was true for me. I never really quite understood like, oh, hey, that like bloating I always get after I eat, maybe that's the dairy until I cut it out. All right, lactose, that's one. Second one is, well, cow's milk is meant for cows. So what that means is that cow's milk is designed or has evolved to be the perfect food for baby cows. Well, baby cows are born at somewhere around 40 to 60 pounds. They have to grow to be 400 or 600 pounds within a six month time span. That's how rapidly they grow, which means that all of the nutrition in cow's milk or in most of the dairy that we consume is meant to take an animal that starts at 40 pounds or 60 pounds to being 10 times that in six months. That is a lot of protein, that's a lot of fat, that's a lot of 
carbohydrate, a lot of minerals, a lot of vitamins. That could potentially be very stressful on the human system to deal with all of those components because it's a lot of everything in this package that's designed and evolved for a baby cow. So that's another issue. Part of what that does, part of that extra mineral load, it causes stress on the kidneys. So there's also the fact that um, cow's dairy can in fact have some issues with pH balance because of all of those minerals I talked about. What that means is that the kidneys get hit with these minerals. It creates an acidic environment. The body likes to maintain its pH balance within a very narrow window, and that's the kidney's job is to do that. So if this uh, dairy gets to the kidneys and the kidneys read it as being acidic, then the body is going to do whatever it can to find an, an alkaline substance or a basic substance to counterbalance the acidic to keep it within that narrow pH range. Well, the body stores those acidic elements, or sorry, those alkaline elements in the bones. So the body will then suck out some of that mineralization to create that acid-base balance where it should be. So that is an issue. However, there are those who would argue that perhaps this isn't as big an issue if everything else in the diet doesn't also cause acidic stress. Now note, this isn't the same thing as going out and thinking that you can re-alkalize your body properly by buying alkaline water. Um, I have seen literally no studies that show that alkaline water actually does anything. So that's not the same thing, all right? We do want to create a net overall alkaline environment in our system, but you know what does that? Eating a lot of fresh fruits and veggies, so yay paleo on that side. All right, we've got our positives, we've got our negatives. So what does that mean for you when it comes for dairy? It depends. It depends on what your goals are, it depends on what your body is like, um, who you are, and how you feel. How you're going to decide what's best as far as dairy goes for you, or at least what I usually recommend to my clients and what I know a whole lot of people have done in the paleo world for a long time, is recommend that you cut it out for a while. You got to cut it out for 21 or 30 days, longer is better. That way you reset your baseline. And now you know what your body feels like without dairy. You know what it feels like without that kind of interference. Then when you add some dairy back in, you know how you feel on the other side of it. A client of mine actually just did this the other day. He thought that he was okay. He had, been not eating, he had not been eating dairy for a little while and went and had a cream-based sauce, completely wrecked him. And he was like, well, learn that lesson. Maybe cream is not so great for me. So that might be the case for you. What I recommend when you add the food back in though is you should be careful about adding in one thing at a time. It's not a great idea to add in butter and yogurt and uh, cheese and drink a glass of milk all at the same meal or even all on the same day because then you don't know how your body responds to those different types of dairy. Because it could be that maybe your body doesn't respond to butter, but maybe it responds to actually drinking a glass of milk. Again, that's me. I can use butter every single day and never have a problem, but if I were to drink a glass of milk, that would not be a pretty sight for, for me or for my, for, yeah, it just would not be a pretty sight. So, um, I generally, so I tested it for myself to figure out what worked. That's the, that's the only way that you're gonna find out what's gonna work for you is to do this cut out and add back in. For most people, they are gonna find that a little bit of some kinds of dairy are gonna be okay for them. Now, what are the sort of rules around, not really rules, but what are the things that typically make dairy easier on people? Well, first off, goat and sheep dairy often have a different impact than uh, actual cow's dairy. I don't know for a fact, but I, the, what makes sense for my, in my brain from a, in a theoretical perspective at least, is that it's because a goat and sheep are of a similar size to human, much more so than a cow is. That's also based on me looking at and analyzing the fatty acid composition of the milk and the, that we get from sheep and goats versus getting from cow. And that fatty acid composition is actually closer to the fatty acid comp composition of human breast milk. I think that's part of the reason why goat and sheep's milk doesn't affect people in the same way. I don't have an actual study to prove that, but I do have a whole lot of, um, sort of first person accounts, right? Real human accounts of, of that being true for them. So I highly recommend checking out some goat or sheep dairy. And you will see me sometimes using one of those things because 
Um, again, I find for the most part, a lot of people can handle a little bit of it every so often. And uh, I think goat's cheese is awesome. So <laughs> the other thing, or one of the other things is um, grass finished. So as I talked about with fatty acid composition here with the goat sheep, it's um, being a little bit different. Well, grass finishing the, uh, the cow also has an impact on the fatty acid composition. So if you can find and actually eat grass finished um, dairy products, that's going to shift that fatty acid composition in a way that for most people is going to be um, less impactful on their health. Um, it's also, you know, if we are sitting here trying to eat uh, in a way that respects evolutionary nutrition for ourselves, then I also think that it's a great idea to support that in our animals and that if our animals eat what they're supposed to eat, then that's going to impact our health too. So grass finished. And on the other side of that is also raw, right? Most milk that we find in the store, most pasteurized milk, that's processed product. Pasteurized and homogenized milk is not the way milk is when it comes straight out of the cow. So if you are in a place where you can get your hands on some raw dairy and you feel safe doing that, I highly recommend it. Um, I know that my parents have, they bought a share of a cow out in New Mexico and so they get raw milk all the time. And I know that both of them feel a lot better doing raw dairy than they ever did doing pasteurized, homogenized stuff that you buy in the grocery store. So that's the other part. Then fermented, that is gonna be things like kefir kefir, however you pronounce it, um, which is a fermented yogurt product. So I, uh, the reason why fermented dairy is going to help is because those little bacteria are going to go in and they're going to start breaking down that lactose. So you're not going to have the same level of, um, of lactose dumping into your system. So that's going to be good there. You also are going to get more, um, you're going to get some probiotics when you do that too. Not a bad thing. Number four is that we want to minimize any kind of growth factors or, I should say and or, hormones, right? Adding growth factors and hormones into our, into our dairy or into our um, cows is, again, not keeping in line with the idea of letting cows kind of be cows and, um, you know, live, live a life that's more in line with how they should be living or how they would be living if they were wild animals. Now, if cows were wild animals, they probably wouldn't have survived very long. Uh, but, and they are definitely domesticated animals, and we are not trying to do historical reenactment here, but I think it's also hard to say that there's anything about adding growth factor or hormone to uh, cows that's really benefiting their health. So healthy animal, healthy dairy, healthier us. Number five, the final, and the thing I think that annoys people the most is genetics. Now the reason that annoys people is because there's really very little you can do about it, right? And in this particular fact, it's not that my genetics are any different than Chris, who's behind the camera, or Rob, who's sitting over there. Our genetics are the same. But what might be different is what's called epigenetics, which means that perhaps my ancestors lived in a place where they had generation upon generation upon generation upon generation upon generation of eating dairy products past the age of when they normally would have been. So what it ended up doing was that feedback put pressure on the genes that create what, what's called lactase with an A, right? This is lactose with an O. I'm talking about a thing called lactase with an A. Lactase is the enzyme that allows you to break down lactose. All little babies have lactase. So again, if I lived in a world where my, all of my ancestors going back were consuming a lot of dairy product, that would give feedback to the body that it needed to continue making this lactase, this enzyme, well past the age of three, because otherwise I'm going to be super sick. So that concept, that lactase persistence, is all dependent upon the ancestry that, uh, that I come from, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, my ancestors do not give me lactase persistence. But as I talked about before, about 70% of the world population doesn't have that, right? They are lactose intolerant. So only about 30% of the people out there have some kind of lactase persistence. So their bodies can well deal with lactose past the age of three. There are also some other genetic factors too that are gonna impact how you can handle dairy. Maybe your kidneys can handle the mineral load a little better, whatever. But that's always gonna be a factor. So 
At the end of the day with dairy, it's always, it depends. It's what works for you. And here at Paleo University, we encourage you to experiment and figure out what works for you. And if you see dairy in some recipe that I create and that doesn't work for you, swap it out for something else or leave it out. That's always how the recipes are designed and created is that you can make those changes. All right, you have any other questions about dairy, anything I didn't cover, any of that stuff, send it to us and we'll get that information out to you. Thanks and see you next time.